distinguished guests, and our respected DGS members. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the DGS February dinner meeting. On behalf of Bahrain Science Society, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Garwan is the Chief of Atomic Energy Oversight Bureau at the King Abdullah City of Atomic and Renewable Energy in Riyadh. So please help me welcome Dr. Mohammed Garwan to the stage. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulihi al-ameen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Firas. Thank you, Khalaf. Thank you, Ms. Fahr, Muhammad. Thanks to all of you. And uh, I hope that I will not disappoint you tonight. The title of this talk is, What Does It Take to Introduce Nuclear Power for the First Time? I would like to add, in any country, for the first time in any country. The title sounds very promising, and it reminds me of uh, a little booklet we used to use called How to Teach Yourself English in One Week Without a Teacher. So I assume <laughs> don't expect anything like that from this lecture. Uh, I would like to explain my approach. And again, the approach and its explanation is meant to set the expectation. Uh, I'm going to talk at a very high level. And as they say, if something is one, you know it. If it is two, you touch it. If it is three, you also get familiar with it. But if it goes beyond that three, it is infinity and nobody can comprehend it. There's a little bit of that in, in uh, nuclear physics. Sometimes they call it no, n not nuclear, not clear physics. Uh, again, there are so many good things about the number three. Uh, in arguments, you, see, you hear people say, I have three points. Sometimes they have only two, but they reserve the third just in case. So, uh, is it okay? Sorry. There are so many good things about talking about three things and getting things in threes for one reason. Engineers know that Choosing any random three points in space, you identify a plane. Is that right or not, engineers? Number two, if you want to anchor anything, you can put it with three contact points and it can be stable, like a tripod and in your field trips when you cook also. The last point about the approach, which I have the list here. I have a list of disclaimers. Number one, I consider myself a beginner when it comes to atomic energy. And beginners always, they have to have bicycles like this. And it's not a secret if I tell you that if you give me a bicycle with only two wheels, I can drive it if I go in a straight line. But ask me to turn and I will fall. Uh, that's why I have a bit of disclaimers to, to mention to you. Number one, the, the, the approach for this talk will be slightly academic. So I'm sorry if I bore you. Number two, I will explain very easy and blunt and clear things. So it's not meant to intimidate your intelligence at all. But bear with me, please. Number three, 
everything I'm going to tell you tonight is not a secret. Any one of you can have access to it. It's in the public domain. So please refrain from saying, the guy told us all the secrets, or anything like, uh, it was a very rigorous uh, talk or anything like that. It will neither be secrets nor very rigorous or mathematical in any sense. The talk will be a little bit disorganized, and I'm sorry about that. There will be some unclear points. There will be some incomplete points. And finally, please do not call it contradiction if you hear two pieces of information that do not match. It's because they come from different sources or because of doing the same thing in a different way. Now, with all of these disclaimers, I will move on. The agenda. Again, I will keep the number three until the end. <laughs> so we have three aspects to talk about. We have three questions to answer. And there are three phases that any country want, that want to get into nuclear energy has to pass through. Each phase ends in a milestone, so we have three milestones. And there are three major organizations that have to exist in any country serious about nuclear power. And there are so many other threes. When we talk about all of these sets of three things, please bear with me. As I told you, it will be disorganized talk, and we'll talk about all of them together at the same time. Let's start. The first set of your threes is heat, steam, and electricity. You have a power station. Easy. Now, if you change the source of heat and use a new thing called a nuclear reactor, some people in the early days, they used to call nuclear reactors atomic smashers or something to that effect. So it is a tool that breaks the atom or breaks the nucleus and generate energy out of it, mostly in the form of heat. And the heat vaporizes water, generates steam, steam generates electricity. Sorry, explaining the obvious. It is another power station that has atomic energy. Is it atomic or nuclear, by the way? Sometimes we get into Byzantine or Byzantic type of uh, discussion on which one is correct. Is it atomic or, or uh, nuclear? Scientifically, it is nuclear. Colloquially, politically, by use, it is atomic. So when, from far away, when you talk about atomic energy, we're talking about nuclear reactors, so it is the same. It is energy coming from the nucleus of the atom. And we can generate energy from the nucleus of the atom in two ways, either fusing atoms together, two nuclei, we put them together, and we get energy, or break an atom, break a nucleus. The last is called nuclear fission. The first is called nuclear fusion. Fission happens to heavy elements. Fusion happens to light elements. The sun is fueled on fusion. The difference between the two is that one is much easier to handle, and our scientists, human scientists, were able to curtail it and sustain it 
and confine it and use it, which is fission. If it is not curtailed, if it is not controlled, it goes out of hand and it becomes an atomic bomb. And that's something you don't want to happen. Fusion, for the last 40 years, that's, that is the time when I started to recognize fusion. For the last 40 years, I've been hearing people saying it is around the corner. It's coming in less than 50 years. And the same number is kept until today. If you ask scientists, how long will it take to have a sustainable, controlled fusion? They will tell you the same number. It is like, how long will oil last? Aramco kept telling us, you have another 50 years, don't worry. And they keep saying it. And through discoveries, like the one that took place last week, we kept pushing the limits to more than 50 years. So we have a similar case here. Let's continue. Now, in order to have fission, you have to have fissile material or fissionable material. Again, they are the same, but with slightly small difference. Fissionable material, every fissionable material is a fissile material. Sorry, every fissile material is fissionable, but not every fissionable is fissile. And I'll tell you why. And in both cases, it is meant that any element, of course, it has to be a, a heavy element, that, is, that enables sustaining fission. Sustaining fission means creating the fission, keep it going without it going out of hand. That is fissionable material. It is uranium and thorium. These are the only two fissionable material that comes to mind. And these are the only two materials that are considered nuclear material in the political and the scientific sense. And I'll tell you later why political. Uranium-235 is the nucleus that is fissioned in every almost every power reactor around the world or even in every reactor around the world, in 99.999 of the reactors. It is easy. You hit a nucleus with a, nucle with a neutron. For your one neutron, you get at least two neutrons. And the two neutrons give you four, the four give you eight, and so on. If you let it go, multiplying as such, in picoseconds, you have an atomic bomb. But you don't want that to happen. What you do is that you curtail it through control rods or control ways, where at the optimum operating uh, conditions of a reactor, you keep it for every neutron you get, you have, for every neutron that hits the uh, nucleus, you get another one. So on the average, you have the same reaction, the same atoms being split constantly versus time. And that's what's called uh, sustainable or, or sustained reaction. Sustained chain reaction in a nuclear reactor. We go back to fissile material. Fissile material is another way of making nuclear fuel, but it's not directly the atom that you bombard with a neutron that is fissioned. It is an atom that absorbs the neutron, changes into another, a nucleus that absorbs the, the, the neutron, changes into another one, changes into another one, and then it is fissionable. 
And all of that also is uh, possible to, to sustain a reactor, to sustain a reaction. Anyway, if you have a pencil eraser of nuclear fuel, we all know what a pencil eraser is, size. It's less than one cubic centimeter. Now, the amount of energy that you can get from that much of nuclear fuel is equivalent to one ton of coal or 149 gallons of oil or 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. This is not a comparison to say what is good or what's bad. It's a comparison to tell you about the energy concentration in the nuclear fuel. It is a few orders of magnitude higher than what people are used to in their life. People are used to burn wood, methane, diesel, you name it, and you get a number in the units of megajoule per second, per kilogram, megajoule per, ki per kilogram of fuel. Now, once you move into nuclear fuel, it is three orders of magnitude at least higher than the energy you get from chemical reactions that produce energy. Nuclear reactions is at least three orders to six orders of magnitude and for the same amount of material. I'm not going to go over that table. Now, with all of this set, people became familiar with fission. They control it. They made reactors. And as we speak, these are fresh data from the, atomic, from the International Atomic Energy Agency website. There are 443 nuclear power reactors in operation around the world, generating 391, 358 megawatt, megawatt of electricity as installed capacity. At the same time, there are 52 reactors being built again around the world. Now, once these 52 are connected to the grid, they'll be, ca they'll be capable of providing 54,695 megawatt of electricity. Humanity has gone a long way. We have now 18,375 years of experience in running reactors. The world as we see it now, we have about 30 countries that have up and operating reactors and building more or not building or closing some or phasing out. We have some countries around the world that are trying to install nuclear energy for the first time to their energy, to their energy grid. Some of them are already actually building reactors. One of them is our neighbor, the United Arab Emirates. Last week, or the week before actually, they received the first license to operate a reactor. So they are getting the license to actually bring fuel into the reactor and start commissioning it. And so on. There are always, at all the time, a number of 60 plus or minus 10 countries claiming to be planning for atomic energy, for nuclear energy. But only a few succeed. Not everybody succeeds. Again, with all of what I said, nuclear power industry is the most sensitive industry on Earth. It is the most observed 
you cannot do, you cannot build a reactor without everybody, know, everybody knows about it. It is the most documented. Choose a reactor around the world and you can find out when it was an idea, when was the first concrete put in that site, when it started operation, and even when and at what dates it goes out for maintenance. Every single detail about every reactor around the world is being on record. It is the most regulated industry around the world for obvious reasons, and we'll go over some of the reasons. Yet it is the most reliable energy in terms of capacity factor. And capacity factor means if you install a 1,000 megawatt of energy, how much of the time it will be available to you? No energy can be provided for 100% of the time, 27, 20, 24 hours, seven days a week around the clock. There has to be time for maintenance. And the capacity factor usually is, is measured in percentage. The highest capacity factor belongs to nuclear energy. So it is the most reliable, the most dependable energy as base load. And base load means the load that people need day and night, summer and winter. And if you build a nuclear reactor and you, and you don't use it as a base load, you are crazy. Because it is meant to be base load, it is meant to be running. One more point among the most things is that it is the cost of energy coming from nuclear power is the most predictable cost for one reason. The overnight cost, the cost that you put on the ground before you switch on your power plant. By the time you switch on your power plant for the first time, you have already paid more than 75% of all the electricity that you will receive from this power plant for its lifetime. And the lifetime is 60 years, extendable to 80 or 100 years. So you know a priori that what will be the cost of, of, of energy coming from this power plant. There will be operation, maintenance, and fuel, but all of that is less than 20%. Now, if you have a fossil fuel power station and oil prices goes up by 20 or 30 percent, immediately your price per kilowatt hour goes up. Now, if you double the price of nuclear fuel or triple it, you hardly feel a difference in the cost of electricity coming from a reactor. Why? Because the fuel cost is less than 5 percent of what it takes to install or run a nuclear reactor. Unfortunately, nuclear energy is also the most misunderstood aspect of, of generation of electricity. There are a lot of good things about nuclear energy. It's good for the environment. We said a few good things about it. It's a low carbon emission. It's regulated, it is safe, and I know some of you might not agree with this. It's so many good things about it, and everybody wants atomic energy. There are 60 or 70 countries trying to get nuclear energy into their energy mix. And by energy mix, it is where your electricity is coming from. Is it coming from fossil fuel, solar energy, renewable um, waste to energy, wind, 
whatever. Now, contribution from all of these sources is the energy mix. And day after day, it is proven that the best way for any country is to have an energy mix rather than to have a single source of energy for different reasons. But what is the best energy mix for any country? It's an optimization case. You have to have it sustainable. Sustainable has three aspects. It has to be environmentally friendly, although it's mentioned down. It has to be run by the indigenous people, the people in the same country. Sustainability, in brief, means if you close the borders, you can still generate your energy. One of its meanings. It has to be economically viable. Uh, it has to be reliable, so you don't have any outages. It has to be regulated well. It has to be scalable. You can, you should be able to, to develop it further, environmentally friendly, and maneuverability. And I would stop around maneuverability. Sometimes you include in your energy mix an element that is not necessarily the most economically viable issue. It's a little bit higher, but you need that element to keep coming, to keep running. And the very, very clear example on this is nuclear energy. Nuclear energy nowadays might not be the most competitive, although it is very competitive, but for the first time you do it, it's not competitive in any country. Yet, to get down or to get all the way into producing electricity from nuclear power, you have at least a head start of 10 to 15 to 20 years of work. Now, if it is needed later on, if it, is, if it becomes for technological breakthroughs or for whatever reason, if it becomes competitive, you have to be ready for it. So this is what I mean by maneuverability. An energy mix, a good energy mix, is an energy mix that allows the country to maneuver around increasing one form of generation, decreasing the other based on the circumstances. And that's why you have to have a small element of each, even if it's not economically as viable nowadays. So what is it? Is it technical? Is it geopolitical? Is it economical? I'm going to go a little bit faster now. It is all of that, not only all of it, but all of it together, not one at a time, <laughs> and all the time and more issues. For a country to move into introducing nuclear power, it should answer three questions. The why, the how, and can we do it or not? Now, in order to think even about nuclear power, you have to talk to the rest of the world. We said it is the most regulated. Yes, it is the most regulated. And it is internationally regulated industry. So you have to talk to, to make sure that the country is a signatory to the MPT. The MPT is the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Arms. It has three pillars. Number one, one helps another to make peaceful use of atomic energy. Number two, no use is allowed if it is diverted into military. 
Number three is disarmament among those countries that have nuclear arms. These are the basics of MPT. It makes sense, and it is the logic that 190 countries have accepted. There are only five countries that are non-signatory to the MPT, India, Pakistan, Israel. And North Korea was a signatory, but withdrew from that. And the fifth country is south of Sudan. They probably didn't just have the time to sign it. Otherwise, they are fine. This is MPT. It is the regime. It is the international regime of atomic energy. And it's looked after by the International Atomic Energy Agency. The International Atomic Energy Agency is headquartered in Vienna, Austria, among many other organizations in this place, which is the UN site for, for, for uh, atomic energy and other, other uh, organizations. And there are a few things that you have to write. If you want to get a credit card, the banker will tell you, OK, yeah, I have a few papers to sign. So here are the few things that you have to sign to make sure that people understand you and you understand people. You have to talk to the IAEA and sign the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, which is by virtue of being a signatory to the MPT, you have to do that. If you don't do that, as if you are not. You have to sign a few multilateral conventions, some on safety, some on security, some on civil liability, some on seeking help and giving help in case of an emergency, some on early notification, you name it. I'm not going to go all over that. Now, even if you sign all of these, you are not done yet. You have to have enough bilateral agreements. And enough varies from one country to another. Nuclear industry, because it is regulated, you cannot buy a thermometer or a thermocouple or any gadget that is nuclear grade or will be used in a nuclear facility from any country unless you have a bilateral agreement with that country enabling you and that country to talk together and agree on principles on how to use those things. This is as simple as I can make it. Now you know why it is the most sensitive, the most observed, the most documented, the most regulated. And it resembles only the aviation industry in terms of being regulated and observed and looked at. Now because of that, and because of the very relevant information gathered from around the world, in the hands of the International Atomic Energy Agency. They came up with something called the Mines Tour approach of introducing nuclear power for the first time in any country. It is a highway, it is very clear, it is very well documented. But God help you if you want to go through that way. It is as promised. Three phases, three one stories, three three three. Everything is three stories. Now, if you really, if you are really serious about introducing nuclear power in your country, you have to work a few things, and actually more than a few, nineteen things. They call them the nuclear infrastructure issues. Make sure you can be understands exactly what it takes to get into nuclear power and declares a national position on this. Three, two, and four. 
you have to make sure that you have good organization with regard to safety, management, and funding of the financing. You have to have a legal framework for atomic energy. You remember the bilateral, the multilateral agreements that they mentioned, John O'Brien or so and so? Now, if there are lawyers here, they will tell you that if a country signs a convention, the obligations emanating from that convention become the rule of the country. And in some cases, signing a convention or a treaty requires the country to promulgate a law, to issue a law, to make it public knowledge, enforce it on all of the citizens of that country that they will abide by whatever that convention or treaty calls for. That's the legal problem. You have to go and make sure your infrastructure is ready. And you have to have big project management muscles in order to bring nuclear projects into a successful uh, finish. The road is clear. It's well documented. It's well known. It starts by thinking and announcing that we would like and we need nuclear power all the way down to connecting your first power reactor in the grid. Phase one and phase two, I would call them pre project. The phase one is an assessment which implies visibility study, visibility not only from the financial point of view, but from the human capacity point of view, from so many ways and things. If you are a small country and your grid size is less than 10 gigawatt, you cannot have nuclear power because if a nuclear power, single nuclear power, is more than 5% of the grid load, it's not advisable if you have nuclear power. If it goes out, immediately 5% of nuclear power goes up or more. And so on. If you are a small country, again, you have to think twice about introducing nuclear power. The first milestone is to make sure that it is feasible and suitable for you. And the second phase is the preparatory work. You remember the 19 issues? You start working on them from phase one and phase two and phase three and beyond. Those are 19 issues. They are not 19 steps. They are not sequential. They are in parallel. And each of them has a requirement for every phase. Finally, the third phase is after signing the contract, you start building the reactor. And if the reactor finishes, you commission it and you connect it to the grid. And that is what's about to happen in the United Arab Emirates. The United Arab Emirates started in 2008, 2009, and now we are in 2020. Infrastructure development, as I said, continues all the way through. From the first day, how, how are we doing with time? <coughs> Back then. <laughs> okay, I was being honest. So, nuclear uh, power plant construction schedules from the first cooling of the structure of concrete to grid connection can range from five years to more than two years. Many things can go on and delay. This is statistics about power plant construction in China. The lease is a little bit lower than 60 years, 60 months. And we're talking here about the third phase only, the construction phase. This is the global median reactor construction period around the world since 1981. And if you see, there are 
the, the best period of building reactors was 2001 and 2005, when the meeting was around 60 months. This is France construction. Now, you remember the one part we saw? Three phases, three body stones. This is the same thing, but it has more details. I'm not going to bother you going all of these details. This is a project management type of details. So you know when you have this, when you have that, and all of that. M1 means one stone one, M2 means one stone two, and so on. This is very important. And again, just three phases, three milestones. But it shows who is responsible about what, and who is more responsible at what time than others. So it all starts with the government. It is the government that decides. It's the government that starts moving people and asking them to do it. And then the regulator comes, and then the owner operator. If we give these names, in most of the countries you find something called Atomic Energy Commission. In Saudi Arabia, it is in the city of Atomic Energy. The nuclear regulator in Saudi Arabia, it has just been established less than two years ago. It is head of the power that we are in the NRRC, Nuclear Geological Regulatory Authority. And it's an honor operator that is under construction now. The honor operator, this is just a fancy name for another scheme, another company that will build a reactor and sell it. But it is special. And I have to mention that for everything that you do and you want to do the same in nuclear, there's a special way to do it. IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, provides help and guidance to the countries by virtue of the NPD, by virtue of its responsibility. And among the help they provide is missions. Those from academia, they know about EBIT certification, EBIT accreditation. It is similar. You do your self assessment, ask some consultants or experts from the IEA to come and, and visit you and let whatever you have prepared for them the way of, of self-evaluation. Uh, among the most important is the engineer mission. It is called the Integrated Nuclear Infrastructure Review Mission. We went through a review to a new mission in July 2018. There are so many other missions, some are regulated, some are checking the operator, some are checking, checking safety, some are checking security, some are checking emergency preparedness. These missions are necessary but not sufficient. Do we have the missions here? Necessary but not sufficient? Anyway, something you have to do because it is a way of telling of telling you something about yourself, but they are not about it. They don't endorse, they don't certify, nor verify, they don't confirm effectiveness. They just come up at the end with recommendations, suggestions, and identify good practice. If you are doing something for the first time that nobody has done and it's good for others to know about. They make it public and they give you credit for it. Out of such exercises and missions, all of them collectively, every country goes and works on something called integrated work plan. It is the mitigation and the bridging of all identified gaps to make sure that every recommendation is taken care of, every suggestion is looked at. The IAEA does not enforce itself on any member state, on any country. You can tell them, bye, I don't want to see you. 
and they are, you're not going to see them. But it is of help to, to go through these missions. Saudi Arabia, as I said, in I think July 2018, we received a mission, the Integrated Nuclear Infrastructure Mission. They spent two weeks. There are about 20 people, 20 experts, spending two weeks in Saudi Arabia talking and handling and looking into document and evidence. They provided us with a report about six months later. Dr. Sultan was receiving the uh, report. I think it was in January 2019. And it was only last month where you see this group of people sitting together with Half of these are Saudis, half are non-Saudis. The meeting was in Vienna. They, are, they have been working over a week to plan our integrated work plan with the IEA to make sure that we are bridging all gaps. In any major project, things can go wrong. And the probability of anything going wrong is proportional to the com to the complications to the to how how complicated your project is in the development phase things can go wrong in the construction phase in the operation phase and even in the decommissioning phase things can go wrong things can go wrong from the technical point of view from the business point of view or from the socioeconomic point of view there are very two clear examples nowadays of how things can go wrong, how budget and time overrun can happen. One example is in Finland, a reactor that should have been commissioned five years ago is still under construction. This is, very, this is in terms of time. The cost of that reactor went up from less than 4 billion euros into close to 9 billion euros, euros. A similar case is in France also, and so many other examples elsewhere. There are countries that have started thinking of nuclear power since the 60s. The two famous examples is Turkey and Egypt. In the 60s, in the 70s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, all of these two countries, they have announced, oh, we have reached milestone two, and they go back. Milestone two, and they go back. It's only recently that both Turkey and Egypt are beyond milestone two. They are into construction now. This is a good point to stop if you want me to stop. Thank you. <laughs>